these as restorations too. That's I really almost completely I when he came over from Italy many, many years ago, thirty years at least I think, um, there were wonderful Russian librarians. Was he a guild or anyhow? Uh, no, he doesn't That's just Jim's son, and so really, yeah, come. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tear you away from the pleasures of, uh, of the mingling and the admiring and the drinking and all of those kinds of things, but you would be disappointed to come to an event like this and not have a little speech of welcome, and I promise that we won't keep you hugely long uh, before you can go back to all of those things uh, and, and get on with it. Um, my name is David Pearson. I'm Director of Culture, Heritage and Libraries for the City of London Corporation, uh, and so it's in that capacity that it is both my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the City of London Corporation to a show that combines two treasured elements of my portfolio in a managerial sense, Tower Bridge and Guildhall Art Gallery. This year, Tower Bridge is celebrating its 120th anniversary, and it's marking that auspicious occasion in several ways. On the 30th of June this year, at the end of this month, you'll be able to visit the bridge and go on to and see the exhibitions for the very special price of 120 pence, rather than nine pounds as it usually is. Later this year, all being well, you'll be able to be amazed by the new glass walkways that are being put in in Tower Bridge for a whole new visitor experience. And here in the gallery, my colleagues have brought together this truly wonderful display of images, memorabilia, that reflect the history of the bridge and its image in the world. A successful architect was Sir Horace Jones, as you probably know, uh, whose imposing portrait is sitting just out here. Um, and together with the engineer, Sir John Wolfe Barry, they constructed what the Times called, in 1894, one of the greatest engineering triumphs of the Victorian age, a view that I think the world has agreed with ever since. It's a bascule bridge. Bascule is the French word for seesaw, which describes the opening movement of those huge arms that lift to allow the ships through. We don't have as much river traffic these days uh, as we had in the 1890s, but the bridge is still very much a working bridge. It is still regularly lifted. If you want to bring a vessel that's over 30 foot high up the Thames, we are required uh, legally to open the bridge for you and as long as you give us adequate notice that's what we will do um, and they still have two or three bridge lifts a day on average right the way through the year. To see the ways that the bridge has been represented and imagined by artists all over that time. There are lots of paintings here particularly in this room that capture the spirit of the bridge as the heart of a busy bustling foggy, dirty maritime business hub, um, but, you know, those numerous pictures around us of the bridge and its outline in the mist through the London smog um, capture very evocatively, I think, that spirit of London in a time which is, which is now gone by. But we also see the bridge in that iconic role of a representation of London as an image of London. I mean, here, you know, right at the very bottom of the Tower of Babel, what is the entrance, what is the opening thing that gets you in but Tower Bridge? Um, and we have that very splendid, unique set of photographs of the bridge being built 
which had kindly been loaned by Peter Harrington that you can see next door. The exhibition also showcases one artist's lifelong fascination with the bridge. Jim Page Roberts began documenting the bridge with a series of photos in the early 1940s. And in the 60s, he bought a warehouse on the Thames in Limehouse, Limehouse turned it into studios, and since then he's produced many haunting views of the river. Um, the bridge very often there is the kind of ghost in the machine, the ghost in the background, an ever-present backdrop that's presiding over the Docklands. And we are very pleased, uh, not only that Jim has lent us a series of his pictures of the bridge which we can include in this display, but also that he's here tonight and he's kindly agreed to say a few words for us. But before I hand over to him, I have a few more thank yous which um, really must be said for the people who have helped to put this show together. The masterminds are Chris Early, who is the business and marketing manager of The Bridge, um, Julia Dukovitz, who is the principal curator of the gallery here, and they've worked with David White, our Visitor Development and Services Director, to put the whole thing together. But they've been ably assisted by a, a number of colleagues in the gallery, at the bridge, uh, in the supporting teams that we have, uh, and I'm sorry not to be able to mention them all here, uh, but they are all listed in the splendid catalogue of this show, um, which is just another reason to buy it before you leave. Uh, and of course, copies are on sale, $9.99, a bargain at the price, and you will not want to leave here without one of those, I know. I must mention our colleague Alan Day from the Guildhall team, who uh, has included his excellent photo of the bridge's centenary in the display next door, alongside the fireworks photos. The artist Chris Orr has kindly lent us four of his views of London and the bridge from the last decade to help us to bring those images of the bridge right up to the present time. I'm delighted that he is here tonight. Um, to bring us right up to date, Mentor Chico, who is one of the artists of the Southwark Arts Forum, with whom the bridge has a close ongoing relationship, has produced this contemporary painting of the bridge and the city, especially for this exhibition and to mark the bridge's birthday. Um, and it is particularly appropriate, I think, that David White, um, who has managed the bridge and has built up that hugely successful tourist business that we now have there over the last decade or so, uh, is immortalised permanently for posterity in this painting. <laughs> I leave you... I leave you to come up later um, and work out which one it is. So, there is... Yes, if you don't know David, yes, his, his colleagues are pointing him out as we speak. So there is a lot here to see and to admire. Um, I hope you will all enjoy the show, but first let me hand over to James Page Roberts to say a few words about his paintings and his impressions of the bridge. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the lovely Julia who arranged all this, <coughs> trying to get uh, one of my paintings which I did in 1954, I think, of Tower Bridge from Bermondsey Wall. <coughs> and um, she couldn't get it because it was in the National Collection and is in some distant embassy and uh, they wouldn't let it. So um, she tracked me down to see if I had anything else that might be uh, of use. Um, so we made an appointment for her to come around. <coughs> now in the 60s, the Port of London Authority, the PLA, gave me a pass and I could work, go anywhere I liked in the London docks to paint and to draw. And uh, it was a great privilege, especially at that time I was importing my own wine and cask and bottling <laughs> <laughs> it at home. <laughs> but, so, one of the places I wanted to go and draw very much, uh, the Crescent Wine Vault. Now, they stood underneath where uh, Mr. Murdoch now has runs his empire. And it was brick built um, by <coughs> Napoleonic prisoners of war, so we hear. And it was festooned with a white fungus. Now, I was told the white fungus was edible. I never tried any. <laughs> um, but, but it was everywhere. 
and the whole cellar was kept at the right temperature, summer and winter time, um, by, and, uh, and also lit, dimly lit, by a few naked gas flares. And it was a magical place to be in. And the, and the head man there, I suppose he was the head cooper or the head wine man, whatever he was, name was Bob. Um, <laughs> he knew that I knew about casks and wine, and we did a lot of tasting. <laughs> <laughs> and we, our instruments were simple. There was a thing called a flogger, which was a, a, rather like a croquet mallet. Um, and then we had a valinch, uh, which was a pipette, which you put into the cast to get the wine out, and the shive, which was the bung. Um, and to get the bung out of the cask, you hit the staves on either side until the bung jumped out. Then you put in the lynch to get the sample of wine, and you poured it into glasses for us to taste. Um, and the glasses were lovely. They were heavy, opaque glass, uh, set into great big lumps of cork. They were very strange things, but they worked as glasses. Um, it was an onerous task, as you can imagine. <laughs> and we tasted a great deal of wine. Um, now, if we came across something that was wrong, uh, maybe a seat of Bacter or cloud and Earth or something like that, we would call on Mr. Arjun. Now, Mr. Arjun had an office in, in London Docks, and he was a chemist. He was a teetotaler, and with his chemistry set, <laughs> a large one, he could turn any faulty wine into perfectly good wine. He was very, <laughs> he was very, very clever indeed. Um, and he was a very nice fellow. Uh, and he did it all without tasting a drop. And one day I was walking past his office and going home, and I thought I'd look in and say hello to Mr. Arjun, say goodnight or something. <clears throat> and he said, uh, come on in, Jim, sit down, and let's have a couple of glasses of wine. I thought, that's extraordinary, you know, to drink. Anyhow, what had happened was that he'd been working all his life with the chemistry of wine and had only just discovered that it was rather good to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, at about that time, <clears throat> I painted a, a self-portrait. I don't know quite why I did it. Um, uh, no reason for doing it. I'd only done one ten years before. And, anyhow. I, and because my brain was full of dockland shapes and colors and things, I made the whole thing up um, out of bits of docks that it was, it's uh, hanging on the wall over there. And uh, I, I shoved it away and completely forgot about it. Uh, and then uh, I think the next thing, what happened next? After that, uh, uh, yes, I tasted the wine. Mr. Arjun, yes, not a, uh, yes, I think, anyhow. Uh, it was all tucked away until, of course, uh, Julia came around to have a look. And we put it up against, we found it, put it up against the wall, and she looked at it, and there was dead silence for a second or two. And then she said, I've seen many pictures in my life, but I have never seen one like that. <laughs> now, I don't know whether that was a good thing or bad thing, <laughs> but it is hanging on the wall over there. Um, and now, anyhow, it gives me a uh, tremendous pleasure. I was going to cut a ribbon, but I don't think they trusted me with the scissors or something. <laughs> <laughs> Health and safety, I think, came into it. Somewhere. So now, <laughs> without further ado, I would like to uh, say that th this exhibition is now open. It's wonderful.